Hey YouTube, what's up? Dr. T here, and welcome to the Altcoin Express and my hometown, St. Petersburg, Florida. So, uh, welcome, Andre. I'm really glad you could join me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, a lot of people already know your work in deep learning, but uh, not everyone knows your personal story. So, I'd like to ask and start by you know telling us how did you end up doing all this work in deep learning? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think uh, my first exposure to deep learning was when I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto. And so Jeff Hinton was there and he was teaching a class on deep learning. And at the time it was uh, restricted Boltzmann machines trained on MNIST digits. And uh, I just uh, really liked the way uh, kind of Jeff uh, talked about training the network, like the mind of the network, and he was using these terms. And I just thought it was, there was a kind of a, a flavor of uh, something magical happening when, when this was training on those digits. And uh, and so that's kind of like my first exposure to it, although I didn't get into it in, in a lot of detail at that time. And then when I was doing my master's degree at the University of British Columbia, um, I took a class with Nando De Freitas, and that was again uh, on machine learning. And that's the first time I kind of uh, delved uh, kind of deeper into these networks and so on. And uh, kind of what was interesting is that I was very interested in um, artificial intelligence. And so I took classes in artificial intelligence. But a lot of what I was seeing there was just very not satisfying. Like it was a lot of kind of, uh, you know, depth first search, breadth first search, uh, alpha beta pruning and all these things. And I was like not understanding how, like I was not satisfied. And so when I was seeing neural networks for the first time, like in, in machine learning, which is kind of this term that I think is more technical and not as well known in kind of, uh, you know, most people talk about artificial intelligence. Machine learning was more kind of a technical term, I would almost say. And so I was dissatisfied with artificial intelligence. And when I saw machine learning, I was like, this is the AI that I want to kind of spend time on. This is what's really interesting. And, um, and that's kind of what, what took me down those directions, is that this is kind of a, almost a new computing paradigm, I would say. Uh, because normally uh, humans write code, but here in this case, uh, we're right, the optimization writes code. And so you're creating the input-output specification, and then you have lots of examples of it, and then the optimization writes code, and sometimes it can write code better than you. And so I thought that was uh, just a very new kind of way of thinking about programming, and uh, that's what kind of intrigued me about it. Then through your work, one of the things you've come to be known for is that you're now the human benchmark for the ImageNet uh, uh, image classification competition. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that come about? Uh, so basically the ImageNet challenge is kind of a, it's sometimes compared to kind of the World Cup of computer vision. So a lot of people kind of care about this benchmark and the number, our error rate kind of goes down over time. And it was not obvious to me kind of wh where a human would be on the scale. And I've done a similar smaller scale experiment on CIFAR 10 data set earlier. So what I did in CIFAR 10 is I just was looking at these 32 by 32 images and I was trying to classify them myself. At the time, this was only 10 categories, so it was fairly simple to create an interface for it. And I think I had an error rate of about 6% on that. And so uh, that was, um, and then based on what I was seeing and how hard the task was, I think I predicted that the lowest error rate we'd achieve would be like, uh, okay, I can't remember the exact numbers. I think I guess like 10%, and we're now down to like 3 or 2% or something crazy. Uh, so that was my first kind of, um, fun experiment of like human baseline. Um, and and I thought it was really important uh, for the same purposes that you kind of point out in some of your lectures. I mean, you really want that number to understand, uh, you know, it, how well humans are doing and so you can compare machine learning algorithms to it. And for ImageNet, it seemed that there was a discrepancy between how important this benchmark was and how much focus there was on getting a lower number and us not understanding even how humans uh, are doing on this benchmark. And so I created this uh, JavaScript interface, and I was showing myself the images. And then the problem with ImageNet is you don't have just 10 categories, you have 1,000. And so it was almost like a UI challenge of, obviously, I can't remember 1,000 categories. So how do I make it so that it's, it's something fair? And so I listed out all the categories, and I gave myself examples of them. And so for each image, I was scrolling through 1,000 categories and just trying to kind of uh, uh, you know, see, based on the examples I was seeing for each category, what this image might be. And I thought it was a, just an extremely uh, instructive exercise by itself. I mean, I was not, I did not understand that like a third of ImageNet is dogs and like dog species. And uh, so that was kind of interesting to see uh, that the network spends a huge amount of time caring about dogs. I think a third of its performance comes from dogs. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was kind of uh, something that uh, I did for maybe a week or two. I put everything else on hold. I thought it was kind of a very fun exercise. I got a number in the end. And then I thought that one person is not enough. I wanted to have multiple other people. And so I was trying to organize uh, within the lab uh, to get other people to kind of do the same thing. And I think people were not as willing <laughs> to contribute, uh, say, like a week or two of like pretty uh, painstaking uh, work, uh, you know, just like, yeah, sitting down for like five hours and trying to figure out which dog breed this is. And so I was not able to get like enough data in, in that respect. But uh, we got at least like some um, 
approximate performance, which I thought was uh, was fun. And then this was kind of picked up, and it's uh, and it wasn't obvious to me at the time. I just wanted to know the number, but this became like a, a thing, <laughs> and people really liked the fact that that this happened. And uh, I'm referred to jokingly as like the reference human, and of course, I, that's kind of a uh, hilarious to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> were you were, were you surprised when um, you know software deepnets finally surpass your performance? <clears throat> Uh, absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, especially, I mean, sometimes it's really hard to see in the image what it is. It's just like a tiny blob of, like, a black black dog is obviously somewhere there. And I'm not seeing, like, you know, I'm guessing between, like, 20 categories, and the network just gets it. And I, I don't understand how that comes about. Uh, so there's some superhumanness to it. But also for the, I think the network is extremely good at these kind of, like, statistics of, like, fur types and textures. And it's just, I think in that respect, I was not, surprised that the network could better measure those fine statistics across lots of images. Um, in many cases, I was surprised because some of the images require you to read. Like, it's just a bottle and you can't see what it is, but it actually tells you what it is in text. And so as a human, I can read it and it's fine. But the network would have to learn to read to identify the object because it wasn't obvious just from, from it. Um, you know, one of the things you've become well known for and that the deep learning community has been grateful to you for has been your teaching the Stanford class and putting mm -hmm. that online. Yeah. Uh, tell me a bit about how that came about. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I felt very strongly that um, basically this technology was transformative and that a lot of people want to use it. It's almost like a hammer. And what I wanted to do, I was in a position uh, to uh, randomly kind of hand out this hammer uh, to a lot of people. And I just found that very compelling. It's not like necessarily advisable from the perspective of a PhD student because you're putting your research on hold. I mean, this became like 120% of my time and I had to put all of research on hold for maybe, uh, I mean, I taught the class twice and each time it's maybe four months. And so that time is basically spent entirely on the class. So it's not super advisable from that perspective, but it was basically the highlight of my PhD. It's not even like related to research. I think teaching the class was definitely the highlight of my PhD. Just, just seeing the students, just the fact that they were really excited it was a very different class. Um, normally, you're being taught things that were discovered in 1800 or something like that. But we were able to come to class and say, look, there's this paper from like a week ago or even like yesterday, and there's new results. And I think the undergraduate students and the other students, uh, they just really enjoyed that aspect of the class and the fact that they actually understood. So there's not, um, you know, so you don't have to, this is not nuclear physics or rocket science. This is like you need to know calculus and linear algebra, and you can actually kind of understand everything that happens under the hood. And so I think just the fact that it's so powerful the fact that it's uh, that it keeps changing on a daily basis, if people kind of felt like they're on the forefront of something big, and I think that's why uh, people like really enjoyed that class a lot. Yeah. So um, here is the course it was introduced in the first seminar by Andrew Kapathy's um, advisor, Fifi Lee, and he then proceeds to um, jointly and mostly he teach the class for the rest of the series, which is 15 uh, episodes long. I went through this last year. It is phenomenal. Um, it doesn't matter what air, what area in, in deep learning you are interested in. It covers the basics. They all have the same kind of issues. And uh, this is a great way to start your adventure into deep learning. So I encourage you to, to invest some time in the class and uh, and see how things go for you after that and I will continue with the second part of this interview shortly.